This meeting is being conducted using uh, virtual connectivity technology. We're allowed to do that given some relief that the governor issued, uh, giving us relief from the open meeting law provisions, allowing us to do this virtually. We've been doing it since March, so. Here we are today. We will call this meeting to order. It is public meeting number 324. I've said it before, when we conduct virtually, that means something particularly to all of you who are here for meeting number one. Uh, today is October 22nd, start 10 a.m. and we'll call this meeting to order with the minutes. Commissioner Stebbins. Uh, sure, good morning, Madam Chair. Um, in your packet, uh, you have the minutes from the July 30th, 2020 commission meeting. Uh, I would move their approval subject to any corrections for typographical errors or any other non-material matters. Any corrections or edits, commissioners? I'm, I'm looking for Gail, Commissioner Cameron. Did we, I should have called to order to a, a roll call for a call and I didn't do that, but she was here and now she is not. Can you text her? Karen, yeah, I'll, I'll let me get in touch with her. Hold on. I wonder if there was just a disconnect, and then we'll I'll do the roll call again. Hello. Hi. Hey. Hi, Kathy. I have called in because I dropped out and I'm unable to get back in so far. I'll continue to try. Okay, as long as you can hear us. We were looking for you. Um, yeah, so just, I dropped out and it doesn't let me back in yet, so I'll continue. Oh. Your absence was duly noted. So um, <laughs> I just am going to do a roll call because we are working virtually. So uh, Commissioner Cameron. Um, the present. Thank you, Commissioner O'Brien. I am here. Commissioner Zuniga. Here. And Commissioner Stebbins. Uh, present. Okay, so we're all set on that. And then uh, uh, if, um, when Commissioner Cameron reconnects virtually, here she might be coming. In. I think I'm back on. There, there you Thank are. You. So, excellent. So I don't know if you heard uh, Commissioner Stebbins made his motion for the minutes. You might have missed that. Commissioner Stebbins, do you want to repeat, please? Um, sure, Madam Chair. Uh, colleagues, I would uh, be happy to make a motion to approve the minutes from the July 30th, 2020 uh, commission meeting. Uh, as always, subject to any corrections for typographical errors or any other uh, non-material matters? Any a second? Do I hear a second? Oh, yeah, I'll second that. Thank you. Any edits, corrections? Okay, uh, Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Uh, Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Stem uh, Zumika. Aye. And Commissioner Stebbins. Aye. I vote yes, five zero, Shara. Thank you. We'll move right on to the administrative update. Uh, Executive Director Wells, please. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning, Commissioners. So we have two items on the agenda for the administrative update. Uh, the first is the update on the casino COVID compliance as we've been doing uh, for several weeks now after the reopening of the casino. So I'm going to turn that over uh, to Loretta Lilios and Bruce Fan just to give you an update on their operations. At I'll start with Loretta, and then I think uh, Bruce is going to talk to you about the uh, roulette as well, given that that was a change after the last meeting. Thank you. Good morning, Loretta. Hi. Good morning, Chair. Good morning, Commissioners. Um, overall, operations under the enhanced health and safety measures are continuing to go smoothly. Uh, as Karen mentioned, the significant change since you met two weeks ago was the introduction of uh, roulette uh, that you authorized. Uh, so there's about almost two weeks of data on that that Bruce will um, brief you on. But with respect to overall compliance uh, with the COVID related measures, uh, patron compliance has been good with no significant issues to report. Casino employees continue to be highly engaged in enforcing and reminding. Yes, there are times when reminders are needed about the proper wearing of the mask to cover both the nose and the mouth. Uh, casino employees are highly engaged in that um, and overall compliance, no significant issues. With respect to amenities at the properties, 
uh, Encore, the uh, spa and some additional retail space has now been open for a couple weeks. The spa is opened on weekends, operating under state guidelines. I understand that it has been uh, popular. Uh, some of the restrictions are, you know, you come in for your, your treatment, uh, after you enjoy your treatment, uh, you know, the, the patron leaves uh, without some of the other amenities in the spa that you might have access to at other times. But I understand that uh, that it's been fairly popular and it's going well. Uh, Encore is considering another restaurant option. It's Oyster Bar uh, to open uh, next month. Um, again, that would be under state guidelines. Um, MGM, their full service restaurant Chandler's has now opened for weekend service and MGM is continuing with its hotel uh, one floor for invited guests. Am I frozen? Can you hear me? Yeah, you're hear okay you. now. Yeah, you, you're, okay. You, we could always hear you. Oh, okay. Um, and then with respect to uh, plane rail, their full service restaurant Slacks is scheduled to reopen this weekend with weekend hours by reservation uh, because the entrance to that amenity is through the casino the restaurant service is also over 20 21 and over only um, but uh, you know they uh, are scheduled to open and I did want to point out that um, local public health officials have been on site at each of the properties. Uh, you know, of course, our gaming agents have uh, a window uh, into uh, all operations. But with respect to the restaurants, there is also the oversight of local public health. They have been there uh, performing their inspections as well. Um, so no significant issues to report on that front if they're any questions, happy to try to answer them. Otherwise, would ask Bruce to update you on roulette. Any questions for Loretta? Well, uh, Loretta, this is Bruce. I'm assuming that um, our licensees are still remaining well below their allowed occupancy level in terms of patrons on the floor. That's right. Yeah. The occupancy. That's right. The occupancy levels have remained uh, stable uh, since the last report. Uh, even with the introduction of roulette, um, there have been no no real changes in the occupancy levels. So well below uh, the modified level, uh, the well below the reduced levels that you have authorized. Thank you. Other questions? Loretta, do you mind if you have this information uh, reminding us of the other restaurants that are open at Encore? I'm not sure if you know that or not. I know that the full service restaurant Fratelli's is open uh, and that um, they did have a local uh, public health inspection and are, uh, they are open. Um, I don't know, Bruce, can you help me out with what else at Encore might be open? Yeah, I, uh, a Rare is open. Uh, I can't totally think what else is is open there. Yeah, um, I can add in a couple things. Mystique is open. Yeah, okay, great. Um, I think, I'm pretty sure Sinatra's is still closed. Yes, that is closed. And then of course there's the Oyster Bar and um, Waterfront. I think they're both closed, but the Oyster Bar is gonna be opening, is that right? Correct. That's right, um, they're looking to open that next early next month. And of course the buffet is still closed. Yeah. The, um, oh, oh, and so and the sports bar um, on deck is open. Oh yeah, as is brew, I think as well. And, and, uh, and go ahead. I'm sorry. So uh, at Plain Ridge, their um, uh, their food uh, court is open under state guidelines as well. A couple of the places have a reduced reduced selections, I think, um, uh, but but they are, uh, you know, the food court's open. Um, and Bruce and Joe, can you help out on MGM? I I think their food court 
uh, area is open as well uh, there and Chandler's. Yeah, I think, yeah, food court's open. Chandler is just open for the weekends. The, um, uh, their sports bar is open. Um, is that weekends, Joe, I think? Yeah, I think they're like maybe Thursday through Sunday or something like that. And I believe the Italian restaurant is still closed. Yes. I th yeah, I think that's right. Well, I appreciate that. Of course, with each opening comes more jobs. And, um, right. and, and of course, they have the guidelines. So excellent. Thank you so much. Yes. And on the roulette update, uh, uh, currently MGM on weekends has four tables open on the weekends, three tables open on weekdays. They have seven roulette tables uh, uh, ready on the floor. Uh, the response from the public has been very good. Uh, Encore has 16 tables open and with pretty much full play uh, on the casino floor. Uh, it's been received very well by the public and uh, uh, everybody seems happy that Roulette is back. <laughs> Anybody have any questions? How, how's compliance going at specific oh. to tables? Uh, it's been been great. Uh, people getting a little used to sitting at at the table, but you really can't place a bet unless you're sitting because of the way the plexiglass is. So, it people are learning. Yeah, you know? <laughs> if you want to play, you got to sit. You know. Okay. So it's working out great. Thank you. Any other questions for Bruce on roulette? Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you, Loretta. Karen? So the next item on the administrative update is the host community agreement update and our uh, chief of the Division of Community Affairs, Joe Delaney, is going to update you on what's going on there. Hi, Joe. Hi, thank you. Um, so yeah, this is just a quick update on where our licensees stand, you know, with respect uh, primarily to their host community payments, you know, as they related back to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, I'll start with PPC. Um, so when PPC closed down in March, they worked with the town to defer some of their host community agreement payments. Um, and those have, have since been uh, repaid and, and they're basically up to date on all their payments. Um, at Encore, uh, similar to PPC, um, Encore deferred their Chapter 121A payment, which is their you know, payment in lieu of taxes. And I believe that was actually an action of the legislature that allowed those payments to be deferred. Um, but those were paid back um, in July. So they're up to date with respect to that. Encore also has uh, had surrounding community agreement payments that needed to go out uh, in September. Th their requirement is that those uh, surrounding community agreement payments have to be paid within 90 days of the anniversary of the opening. So I, you know, September 23rd, I, 4th, I guess that was. Uh, those payments have all been made um, and um, they, they've sent us all the receipts that show that those, uh, those payments have been made. Um, similarly, MGM, um, they deferred uh, a payment to the city of Springfield back in April. And um, MGM is not uh, yet paid this back to the city, but they have been in conversations uh, with the city about um, repaying this amount. I did speak with uh, a couple of the city officials and they are uh, confident that this payment will be uh, coming soon. And um, also they, you know, they will have surrounding community uh, payments that are due, but those aren't due until uh, November. Same, same deal as Encore, they have like 90 days from the anniversary of the opening to make those payments. So with their opening on August 23rd, I think it was, they would have till November 23rd to make those payments. And that uh, completes my report. Any questions for Joe on that update? Thank you, really helpful. Okay. Uh, okay. So that, that concludes the administrative update uh, item three on the meeting agenda, Madam Chair.
Anything else that you want to add today, Karen? Uh, not that I can think of, but if I think of anything, I'll chime in later. If anything okay. Else Excellent. Thanks. Moving on then to item number four. Today, um, legal division, I, Todd Grossman is, of course, general counsel, but I think we're leading off with Carrie today. Um, good morning, Carrie, on the uh, uh, regulation uh, with respect to the community fund, mitigation fund. Good morning, Madam Chair and Commissioner. Commissioner, um, Teresa, I think uh, the community mitigation fund ones are first. So if Shara could actually share. Oh, sorry. That's okay. I think Shara is going to share this reg for us. All right. Okay, so good morning. Um, so there are two regs on the agenda today. The first is um, this 205 CMR 153 related to the Community Mitigation Fund. Um, as well, they also have um, a small business impact for this reg in your packet. Section 61 of Chapter 23K of the General Laws establishes the Community Mitigation Fund to assist communities with costs associated with the construction and operation of the gaming establishment and delegates authority to administer that fund to the commission. There are currently no regulations codifying the procedures and guidelines for the community mitigation fund. So we've drafted this proposed regulation covering four areas related to the fund. Uh, the first section codifies an annual review of guidelines for the administration and distribution of funds and outlines what shall be included in the guidelines. Um, the, what's included here in the draft reg is taken from um, current and past guidelines. So there's nothing um, new here. We're just adding it to a regulation. So we've included such things as the types of grants available, who may apply, the types of projects that may be funded and any limitations, the availability and allocation of funding, the process and criteria for, 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 excuse me, for commission review, a timeline within which funds must be expended before reverting back to the fund, the use of surplus funds, and a procedure for providing a waiver or variance from a provision of the guidelines. The second section of the reg uh, creates an emergency procedure by which parties seeking appropriations from the fund may submit requests and receive awards on an emergency basis, and the reg defines what would constitute an emergency. In terms of uh, the process for applications, Section 61 of Chapter 23K states that all requests for appropriations from the fund must be submitted before February 1st of each year. So to align with that statute, the draft regulation defines each year as running from February 1st through January 31st and requires that emergency appropriations from the fund for applications received on or after February 1st be funded from the following community mitigation fund fiscal year allocation. The uh, third section codifies the minimum requirements of the grant instrument following an award of funds from the commission. Uh, similar to the first section, this is something that we already do, but we're just codifying it here in the regulation. Um, this would include things like a detailed scope of the grant, the person responsible for management of the, of the grant on the applicant's behalf, a timeline and breakdown for disbursement of the funds, reporting requirements, a requirement that the funds be returned to the commission in the event of non-compliance with the terms of the grant, and indemnification provisions for the commission and its staff. Finally, the last section establishes that the commission may assess to the community mitigation fund reasonable administrative costs incurred by the commission on behalf of and in furtherance of the administration of the fund. At that's a maximum percentage of the funds available in the fund for the fiscal year uh, that may be assessed as administrative costs at 10% and outlines the types of administrative costs that may be assessed to the fund. This would include staff salaries, technology, software, and office supplies. Um, and in particular, it requires that any such cost must be directly related to the administration of the fund. Um, so this is a general summary of the regulation. I know that um, CFO Lennon is on here as well, if you have any questions for either of us about uh, any piece of the regulation. Questions for Carrie? I can't see everyone, so chime in. Oh, there we are. Thank you. Um, can, um, if I'm not hearing any, I have one. Uh, oh, go ahead, Commissioner. Yeah, well, I, I was um, I was just going to make a, a, a point about the financial aspect uh, of it. Uh, I think it's very appropriate to set a maximum um, 
uh, figure, um, and I think 10% is an appropriate or adequate uh, figure. I think there's an intention to overcharge or really lean on this fund to administer it, even though the administration of it that we've done in the in the past has been also very um, very efficient. I would argue very lean when it comes to the activities that we that we do. So I like that it's now being uh, put forward to be part of the process. We can hear from the public and uh, and I think it's also good to codify the other aspects that we've been operating under uh, that also pertain to this regular uh, Yes, if, um, I agree with uh, Commissioner Zuniga that this is a good idea. Actually, I agree with all of the uh, recommended recommended changes are uh, certainly appropriate. I wondered if um, pandemic uh, was the rationale for taking a close look and codifying some of these changes, or was it just um, a normal course of review? Uh, I can field that question. I think there was a normal course of review. I think that had been identified. I think um, our CFO had identified it because it is a, in the normal course a lot of grants uh, yes. that there are administrative costs taken out. So this is you know general practice across the board. So I think this had been um, a situation where we had uh, picked up on that and just wanted to follow through right now because we were looking at budget issues. I don't know if Derek, do you have any comments on that? But that's my understanding. That's uh accurate summary. Um, we've been pushing to do this for a few years. Um, both casinos are fully operational now, so you've got the tax dollars flowing into the Category 1 facilities. You've got the tax dollars flowing into that fund, um, so it seemed like this is a good time. Um, if you recall in my budget proposal, I had already um, requested shifting some of these costs off, and the Commission said, why don't we write some regs, um, run it through the local um, community mitigation groups, um, advisory groups, and then put it out for public comment so that everyone can have a, a say on this. Great, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Stevens. Uh, sure, um, first of all, just a, a, a shout out of thanks to Carrie for all her good work and Derek's involvement and in, uh, in our, uh, our new community team for working through these regs. Um, I think we'd also noted that more money, as Derek just pointed out, is being generated. More money is going out the door, and it's taking up a lot more time on behalf of our team to monitor these, uh, in some cases, very large grant awards, making sure they're being spent appropriately. Um, so I appreciate all the good work that was done. Um, I noted on my call yesterday with Commissioner Cameron as we we're doing our two by twos that. Uh, you know, we discussed this issue of using, you know, monies for administrative costs with our with our LICMAC members and with our subcommittee. Everybody was in agreement, certainly understand, it's a common practice. Uh, but as Derek noted uh, yesterday, that they do want to make sure that, uh, you know, we're not just taking a lump sum every year, but as it's built into our budget process, that we're being mindful of the costs and how well. Uh, uh, we're funding some of those administrative needs. So um, everybody is on board, obviously, in the reg process. They'll also have an opportunity to weigh in. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> just one clarification on that. We were quite careful to bifurcate this process a little bit with respect to the section of this regulation that addresses the uh, use of the funds for administrative costs. Um, our team was not involved in that um, in, in, in light of the potential for a conflict uh, if their salaries might be addressed there. But I do, my question does relate to something I think Joe um, and Carrie um, advised on and Derek advised on. Am I right that the emergency fund piece is also new this year or setting aside? Carrie, yes. Yes, so, yes, that's, that's, that will be, Joe, do you wanna so, speak to that? Yeah, so what we're proposing to do that this year, this, this sort of came out of the whole COVID situation of, I think we had, we had talked about it years past, but I think the fact that we had, you know, crazy situation come up that um, nobody could have foreseen, we decided um, an emergency set aside, if you will, 
um, is appropriate for you know something that no one could ever conceive coming up and and give us more flexibility and let us be a little bit more nimble in, in addressing uh, issues. Yeah, so I think that does um, link to Commissioner Cameron's question that the emergency piece was inspired somewhat by the, the fact that we are dealing with an emergency now. And then the only other um, clarification, because I understand that the fund, funding for any emergency down the road would come from the next fiscal year fund. But Carrie, am I right that it's maybe not addressed in the regulations, but maybe would be addressed in guidelines that if a, a community did have an emergency, they're able to demonstrate it's an emergency and it's, you know, properly meets the requirements that they could actually receive the funding then. It's just that the funds would ultimately come from the next fiscal year as opposed yes. to having to wait for the yes, funding. Yes, that's exactly right. Yep. And I think um, the details of how the process will work will be laid out in the guidelines because it's not in the reg right now. Right, the reg oh. just says that um, that the process will be in the guidelines. Yeah, that's what I thought. Okay, so yeah. that's a helpful clarification. So that's a real new uh, a new choice or asset for communities down the road should they, you know, let's hope it's never as global as what we're dealing with now, but an, a community could have some kind of an emergency. So thank you for that. Any other questions on this? This is really good work, Carrie and team. Thank you. So if there are no other questions, um, you have in your packet a small business impact statement as well as the regulation, and we would be looking for motions on these to begin the promulgation process. Do I have a motion? Madam Chair, I'd move that the commission approve the small business impact statement for 205 CMR 153 community mitigation fund is included in the commissioner's packet. Second. Thanks, commissioners. Any any further questions? All set. Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Zunica. Aye. Commissioner Stebbins. Aye. And I vote yes, five zero. Commissioner Stebbins? Um, sure, Madam Chair, I'd further move that the Commission approve the draft version of 205 CMR 153 Community Mitigation Fund is included in the Commissioner's packet and authorize the staff to begin the formal regulation promulgation process. Second. Thank you. Any questions or edits? Okay. Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Zunica? Aye. Commissioner Stebbins? Aye. And I vote yes, 5 0. Thanks. Great, thank you. Um, all right, so the second regulation you have in your packet uh, is a um, draft amendment to the voluntary self exclusion regulation, 205 CMR 133, and a corresponding small business impact statement for this regulation as well. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Director Vanderlinden <coughs> to run through um, these changes. Good morning, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Morning. 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 Um, so the, the proposed uh, revisions to this regulation are really intended to more closely align the regulation with the current program needs. Um, so I thought I would just walk through with you the, uh, the specific changes that, that we're proposing. Um, the first one is a good example of, of aligning the program with the current needs. Uh, 13302 um, is a small change, but uh, uh, meaning that the commission can um, uh, kind of define what the format is that individuals enroll. This really is intended to allow designated agents to conduct um, remote appointments rather than just face-to-face. -face. Um, this has come up um, as a need of the program in order to allow uh, somebody to enroll by um, electronically or by phone with a designated agent. This is a, this is a process that we're working out the details with our IT and legal departments currently should uh, this change go into effect. Um, the second, 133033, um, really highlights the need for us to always pay attention to confidentiality and protecting personal protected information. 
um, we want to make sure that wherever we can emphasize this through the regulation, we do so. Uh, 133.023 uh, broadens the definition of what a designated agent is. Um, we're clear with this program that it's important that um, for those individuals who enroll persons into the voluntary self-exclusion program that, um, and they are defined as designated agents, that they have the appropriate training and background um, in order to do so, recognizing this is more than just simply an administrative function. Um, by widening the, the definition of a designated agent, it clearly um, uh, includes the game sense advisor. Um, it also broadens it so that um, health and mental health professionals, not just those whom are um, licensed, um, registered, or certified, can enroll persons in, into the voluntary self-exclusion program. Um, 133.031, uh, we, we, we simply are requiring just the last four digits of social security number now as opposed to the full social security number. Uh, the program realized that we did not need access to the full social security number, but the last four um, helped, especially when we need a positive identification for somebody. Uh, 133.032 um, just provides clarification that um, we, we need a photo um, with that clearly shows the facial features of those individuals that are enrolling into the program. Um, but if uh, that individual is wearing, um, wearing headwear, that we would make an exception for religious purposes. 133.038, um, it's, it's really important that designated agents, um, when they're uh, enrolling, helping somebody enroll into the program, um, extend an offer for additional services. The Voluntary Self-Exclusion Program is a, is a, a very good program, um, and it's a, a very important first step for a lot of people to, to um, access additional help. This just defines or broadens the definition of, of what that help is. So we added peer support. We also um, it widened the net beyond just the clinicians approved by the Massachusetts Department of Public Health. Um, but other individuals um, that may be qualified as defined by the Gaming Commission. I like, as I spoke with um, commissioners through the week, um, the perfect example of this is that we have designated agents that are enrolling persons in Connecticut, um, and we want to make sure that those individuals um, also have, are being, receiving additional referrals for help, but we, uh, uh, they would need to find that help in Connecticut. Uh, 133.039 and 133.051 accomplish a, a similar goal, which is recognizing that designated agents um, who uh, um, do the reinstatement session with persons who are on the list need to have access to a, a, a small portion of that list to verify that they are indeed eligible to to do that reinstatement session. In other words, um, individuals who sign up for the voluntary self-exclusion program do so for a one, three, or five year duration. Um, the designated agent would want to confirm that they have completed that piece of it and are eligible for to do the reinstatement session. Um, and the, the final change that we're recommending for this regulation, 133.052, uh, recognizes that there really should not be a need for our licensees to share the list um, with each other, that the Gaming Commission is, holds the master list and we distribute this twice a week, um, so that, that should be sufficient. Uh, that is the extent of the changes, and I uh, realize that these changes um, allow us to continue to kind of evolve the program and into the current needs. Um, I welcome any questions. I can't see, um, so you'll have to speak up if you have any questions for Mark. Um, do you mind removing the uh, uh, document, please? Thanks. Great, thank you. So, um, 
Okay, Commissioner Zinnika, you have a question? Yeah, I, I would just make a comment that these are very straightforward, but uh, um, appropriate, in my opinion, um, as Mark says, uh, changes or up updates to the regulations that really reflect the way that the program needs have evolved uh, since we first promulgated these regulations. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm happy that, um, that we're doing that. It's, it's a good process and um, we'll go along with them. Yeah, I, I would agree that uh, the changes seem really appropriate in particular, um, and I know I asked about this in the two by two, but the, um, the peer support emphasizing that I think is a critical piece um just to understand that that is an option and there are folks that have been through uh what you're through or or maybe not but they're there to support even though they may not be uh, a professional so um that i thought was really uh, an important piece to highlight and I, I see that this whole document just strengthens the program which is already very successful so good work to the team other questions or comments? Just thank you, I see Teresa, and thank you again to Carrie, Teresa, and of course, Mark, excellent. Yeah, and just, uh, I forgot to call out Teresa specifically, but um, she she carries this program every every day, so um, those detailed questions, she's, uh, she's our local expert on. Yeah, so thank you, thank you, Teresa. We know that you are are good and busy on this so and it's so important thank you and everybody loves seeing your background oh, sunny day on the harbor <laughs> see that's the harbor mm -hmm. beautiful all right no further questions we have some motions that you need carrie yes that's right for the small business impact statement and the draft reg uh, to move forward with the promulgation process so, Madam Chair, I move that the Commission approve the Small Business Impact Statement for 205 CMR 13300 Voluntary Self Exclusion as included in the Commissioner's Packet. Second. Okay. Uh, any further questions? Everyone's all set? All right. Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Zinnica. Aye. Commissioner Stebbins? Aye. And I vote yes, 5-0, thank you. Commissioner? Madam Chair, I further move uh, that the Commission approve the draft version of CMR 205 um, 133, voluntary self-exclusion as included in the Commissioner's packet and authorize the staff to begin the formal regulation promulgation process. Okay. Thank you. Any comments or questions? Excellent work. Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Zuniga. Aye. Commissioner Stebbins. Aye. And I vote yes, 5-0. So we'll see those come back after public comment. Correct, Carrie? Yep, that's right. All right, excellent. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you. So what's next for us? Already on to item number five, Dr. Lightbound, there you are. Good morning. Good morning and good morning, commissioners. Um, to start off with, I just wanted to mention that on Monday, we're going to have the um, standard bread, uh, mass bread races, the finals of it. They've had uh, three different rounds of races leading up to these finals and they're gonna give out over um, $700,000 that day. So that's quite a um, success story on the readers program. Um, so our first item on the agenda for today is um, the local aid approval, and I'll turn it over to Chad Bork, our financial analyst, for that. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Good morning, Chad. Good morning, Chad. Good morning. Uh, so today, uh, I, I have the quarterly local aid, which is payable to each city and town where racing activities are conducted. The amounts for this quarter's payment were calculated by using handles that took place in January, February, and March of this year. Uh, so that said, the total local aid payment for the quarter ending September 30th is in the amount of 
$562.59. And in your packet, uh, you will see a breakdown of the handles and uh, the distribution amounts for each city and town. Chad, do you want to go through those? Um, sure. If you, yes, I, I have them, but just in case, I think it's uh, it's interesting. Thank you. Sure. Yes, absolutely. So um, for uh, Plain Ridge, uh, their local aid um, will be in the amount of twenty thousand three hundred two dollars and five cents, um, which is given to Plainville. Um, for Raynham. Uh, the amount is $16,587.90. Uh, that is for uh, the Raynham track, which is given to the town of Raynham. And uh, for Suffolk Downs, uh, they do a split between Boston and Revere. Uh, so the amount for Boston from Suffolk is $86,868.42. Uh, going to Revere from Suffolk is $43,433.56. And then uh, last we have Wonderland, which is also split for Boston and Revere. Um, so stemming from the Wonderland activities, $247.11 uh, will go to Boston uh, or is requested to go to Boston and uh, for Revere, it is $123.55. Thanks. Any questions for Chad? Quick question, Chad. Um, uh, these numbers, um, how do they compare uh, to a previous um, pre-pandemic? Uh, I'm just, it seems to me that a significant uh, amount of those patrons are back um, uh, back betting. Is that is that accurate, or is there a significant drop here? I'm trying to remember what it was prior. Yeah, so um, this is actually because um, the handles um, or local aid is calculated six months prior. Um, mm -hmm. We really didn't see um, a drop off. Um, uh, it was, I believe, $2,000 less in total from um, the, the last quarter uh, local aid. Where we will see um, a, a drop will be um, the following quarter because that's gonna bring down, um, that will be due to um, the, the COVID break that we, that we did take. So there will be a, um, a, a pretty significant drop there. Um, and then, uh, going forward, I, I will be sending out um, uh, an update on the handles and you know how we've been faring so far. Um, I, I can say that the, they're pretty much on par for what we've been seeing from last year. Um, again, this is to an uptick in um, our, our ADW uh, business or the licensees ADW business. Um, yes. So, uh, I, I will I will get that out um, to you today and um, yeah so it it'll be the the following quarter where we see um, a, a, a downtick in the in the local aid. I see. Thank you. Yeah, I see it uh, ends the local aid. These are um, just the uh, that at nine thirty ends just the distributions, but that's not. I, I understand your point that that's not. Um, that doesn't reflect the numbers during um, this period. Yeah, yeah, it just was January through March. So yes. maybe March was impacted, Gail. But I yes. think your, your point is really a good one. So Chad, maybe for the next quarter, quarter, right? Yeah, um, maybe you could do the year over year. Comparison. Comparison, sure. that might be interesting for us. Okay, sure. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, Chad, just on that note, so, it's not going to be zero, right? Even though the following quarter, April, May, June, uh, was the, the racing operations were all effectively closed or uh, you know suspended in operations. There was still some activity because of the ADW. Is that a fair statement? Yes. Very significantly less, but it's not going to be zero. Right. I. I. If 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 I had to guess, it would probably roughly. It's, it's going to total roughly around. Um, 
seventy thousand. So there will be there will be aid paid out. Um, I'm going to be contacting the the people um, at, at the towns to to give them a heads up to let them know that um, this will will be your number. Because again, I do have the numbers um, set out already because the, the handles are based on six months. So yes, they it, it will not be zero, um, but it'll be less than they're accustomed to. Thank you. I'm just thinking ahead, and I'm glad you you're thinking of at least. Uh, Keep town administrators or finance people a little bit of a heads up. Yes. Um, Other questions or comments for Chad? Commissioner Stebbins, all set? Okay, good. All righty. Um, then you have your next item, Alex, Dr. Lightbound. Um, did, did we vote on? Um, the vote well, I guess we have to have a vote. I'm so sorry. Thank I'll you. need a motion, commissioners. Eileen? Commissioner? Uh, certainly. Um, Madam Chair, I move that the commission approve the local aid quarterly distribution for Q3 of 2020 in the amount of $167,562.59 as described in the memorandum dated October 13, 2020 in the commissioner's packet. Second. Thank you. Any further questions? All right. Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Zuniga. Aye. Commissioner Stebbins. Aye. I think that was an aye. We couldn't quite hear you. Aye. Thanks. And um, I vote yes. Five zero. Thank you. All right, um, then we have your next item on the, the fill in judge, and we will need a vote for that as well. Excuse me, uh, Dr. Lightbaum. Thank you. Um, so, um, Steve O'Toole, um, Director of Racing for Plain Ridge Park, has asked uh, for approval of Paul Verrett as the fill in judge. And um, Paul has uh, been their racing secretary for years and has been involved in the harness industry for a very long time. And um, it does have a USTA. Um, license as a uh, judge. Um, Steve O'Toole is on the line if anybody has any other um, questions about Paul. Um, my recommendation is to approve um, Mr. Verrett as a fill-in judge. Commissioner Cameron, you want to comment? Um, I, I believe someone um, left the state, uh, Dr. Lightbaum. Is that correct? why there's a need um, late in the season for an alternate? Uh, right. I'm not sure if he left the state, or, but he um, left the left Plain Ridge um, for another job, the fill-in judge that they had before. So I now see. we need somebody that can fill in till the end of the year. Yeah. No, this is a pretty routine um, request and certainly needed to finish the season with, uh, with the appropriate staffing. And the USTA is the right certification. Yes. Okay. Excellent. Any questions for Alex? All right, then I'll need a motion for this. Um, Madam Chair, I move that the Commission approve the request of Plain Ridge Park Casino to approve Paul Verrett as the alternate judge pending satisfactory completion of licensure by the Massachusetts Gaming Commission Division of Racing and satisfactory completion of his background check by the Massachusetts State Police. Second. Thank Thanks. Any questions, comments? Just a thank you to Director O'Toole for joining today. We appreciate your avail being available for us. Hey, you're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, we'll go ahead with our vote then. Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Zuniga. Aye. Commissioner Stebbins. Aye. And I vote yes, five zero. Dr. Lightbound, it was really nice for to have the chance to see your whole team last week. Um, I was lucky enough to have one of our commissioner meet and greets or whatever we're going to call them with Alex's team, but I felt a little guilty because it was on a racing day and we went a little long, um, but it was a huge treat for me, as I said to you in an email. And, uh, and it was actually, I'm sure I gained much more from it than your team did. So thank, 
thank them. Um, it was really a pleasure. Oh, thank you. And the team really enjoyed meeting with you. It was very special for them as well. Thank you. It was a gorgeous day, and my big regret was I wasn't down there. So um, anyway, congratulations to all of them for a good season so far, and knock on wood, getting through uh, the next month. And Monday, I was going to look for the weather for Monday for you. I'll check in on it. Um, <laughs> thank, thank you. you. We'll stay tuned on that. Um, so you're all set. Then it looks as though we have now um, our Division of Community Affairs. Um, Chung, good morning. Good morning. Thank you, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Um, so today I will be presenting our draft uh, 2021 Community Mitigation Fund guidelines. Um, you know, the process that we went through in developing the guidelines first uh, involved uh, developing a series of policy questions that um, are also in your packet. Now, then we, we discussed these policy questions with all of the commissioners and with our local community mitigation advisory committees and with the subcommittee on community mitigation. And we took all of that input from all of those discussions and that results in the draft document um, that you see before you. So um, in the interest of time, I won't go through the policy questions uh, document um, as really the answers to all of those policy questions are what's in the guidelines. Um, so for the guidelines, we're not proposing any really significant changes to the guidelines for 2021. You know, there are no new categories of grants um, and the grants that, uh, that are in there, uh, all of the existing grant categories remain. Uh, so, you know, given the challenges that we had in 2020, we felt that um, we should only really make changes that are, that are really absolutely necessary to make at this point. Um, now with that, I will share the guidelines so that we can walk through them. Everybody see that? We yes. can. Okay, so what I did here, um, and again, I'm really just gonna go through the, the changes that we made to the document. Um, and what I did is I highlighted all of those in yellow, so it was a little bit easier to follow. Um, and just basically, I did revamp the, the guidelines a little bit. I tried to make them a little bit more user-friendly. Um, you know, these, over the years, these have gotten a, a little bit, uh, you know, as we added new categories in, we added uh, new things. Sometimes it was a bit of redundancy in there. And I tried to sort of clean it up and just make it, hopefully, um, a little more user-friendly. Um, so some of the key things, the application deadline is January 31st, 2021. Um, that is actually a Sunday. And under normal circumstances, we would have pushed it up to probably the Friday before. But since all of these things are filed online and can be filed right up to the very end, uh, you know, if folks wanted to work the weekend to finish it, they could do that. Um, so the first change here that we that we made um, isn't really a change; it's sort of a reorganization. But when we talk about who's eligible to apply, the first thing is the communities in the vicinity of the gaming establishment. Um, and originally, this always just said the host and surrounding communities, but that's not um, really uh, true. In uh, it's not limited to just the host and surrounding communities. So we clarified that this had been in another section of the of the guidelines uh, before, and I just wanted to get it right up front so everybody knows who is uh, what communities are eligible for that. Um, so I will go through, you know, how much funding will be available. So what we did was, um, you know, we did a, a calculation on how much money has been generated in the fund through September of 2020. And we estimated the revenues for October, November, and December. And the way we estimated those was we took the October, November, and December uh, gaming revenues from 2019, and we took 80% of that number for this year. You know, the numbers are running a little bit better than 80%. I think, you know, out in, um, in uh, at MGM, it's uh, almost, uh, I think, 87 or 88%, uh, but we felt that was just being conservative. Um, and this also includes money that has been rolled over from previous years. 
So um, we're putting a target of $12.5 million on the program for this year. Now that still does leave, there's $1.7 million that will still be in the fund at the end of the, at the, end of the, uh, the year. Um, and, you know, we always like to leave some money in the fund, you know, just in case we have, you know, if we have a huge demand for the program and we have a lot of really good applications and if we wanted to go over those target amounts, we have a little bit of money, able, we're able to do that. Um, you know, historically, we haven't had to do that. But again, we always like to be a little bit conservative with the funds just to make sure we're not sort of draining every, every last dollar out of the fund. And how are we gonna split that up? Um, essentially, it's an even split between region A and region B, each with $6 million. And we are reserving half a million dollars for the category two facility. That's of course the Plain Ridge Park facility. Um, typically, we haven't really come close to this half a million number uh, in, in, uh, for category two. Um, but if we don't get that, that money just becomes available for region A and region B. Uh, if we wanted to exceed that $6 million target. Um, so this also includes the money that has been rolled over from previous years. If you remember from last year, actually two years ago, we came up with our policy on how uh, we would uh, sort of divide up the money. We, we agree that the money that was generated in each region would stay within the region, but we also realized that if one region or the other uh, were not using all of their funds and we had large surpluses building up that we would, didn't want to continue to reserve those for that region. Uh, and may, we would make it available for any region, uh, you know, should the need arise. So what has happened is um, the first year that we generated money was 2018. Um, and that was in region B at MGM. And, uh, so we're still rolling over 780,000, almost 781,000. Done some refinements of these numbers. These are going to change just a little bit when the, when the final guidelines go out for public comment. But it's a little bit lower than that. It's actually about 690,000, I think. Um, in 2019, essentially the entire 4.1 million amount in, generated in Region B is rolling over, and about 1.8. 2 million in region A is rolling over um, from 2019. Um, so now, of course, these monies are available for 2021, and we've added those to the money that's been generated by the regions, and you know, have come up with that $12.5 million. Um, this section here, section two on the grant categories, um, we did just put a little uh, caveat in here. Um, last year, we had one of our applicants applied for a single project under two different categories, which is something we never really envisioned happening. Uh, we have no problem with a community applying for money in more than one category. For instance, you could have a transportation planning grant and a specific impact grant, but we didn't sort of envision it the other way where one project would come under multiple categories. So what we are saying is that you can apply for grants in more than one category. However, any individual project may only be included under one grant category. And of course, in the case of what happened last year was we did actually grant both of those grants and in probably the proper way to do it would have been to apply in the one category and ask for a waiver on the, on the dollar amount. Um, so on the next issue that's up for discussion, and, and I would ask for your uh, thoughts on this before we, uh, you know, go out to public comment on it. We have the, the reserves from 2015 and 2016. Um, if you recall, $100,000 was given to each of the communities, sort of the host and surrounding communities, uh, very early on, really to try to... Um, give them some money to do studies and other things to help identify what impacts there might be from the casino. Um, you know, we're going into 2021 and we still have several communities that have not fully expended their reserves. Um, there's almost a million dollars that's out there that, that hasn't been spent in these reserves. So what uh, we would like to do, what we're requesting here is that, um, or suggesting, I should say, is that we give these communities 
until the end of next year to commit these funds. And we're not saying that they all have to be spent, but we're saying that they have to be committed. So for instance, if a community wanted to hire a consultant to try to help better align local businesses with um, opportunities at the casino, say as an example, um, if they have the consultant hired by the end of 2021, that would be fine. And, um, and look, we're also not suggesting that, um, that we're just gonna do this unilaterally. We're gonna reach out to all of these communities that have um, existing funds out there. Uh, once the um, guidelines are approved, and if this is approved, what we would do is first we would send a letter to those communities, letting them know that they have these funds there because you know, there could be certain instances where um, there's been a change of administrations or a change of personnel, the town planner leaves and a new one comes in and they don't know that the money is there uh, or how to even you know, obtain the money or use the money. So um, I guess on that one, I just, I'd, I'd ask um, you know, sort of what, what your thoughts are on, on that particular item. You'd like to pause then right now to yeah. discuss this. I think that makes sense, Joe. Um, commissioners, what do you think? Sure, uh, Madam Chair, I, I, I've, I've talked about this issue with, um, with Joe and, and completely support the idea this is money that uh, you know, we had the foresight to give communities some support uh, prior to the uh, casinos opening so they could assess impacts or look at opportunities. So I'm, I'm on board with, uh, uh, with the team's recommendation about uh, these reserve monies. Um, but I do want to go back to, and, and Madam Chair, you phrased this idea of having uh, some type of grant uh, best practices session um, uh, to assist communities uh, in their applications. Uh, this might be a, an aspect of, of such a session mm -hmm. is to invite those communities in. And, and I like the outreach Joe has planned to say, hey, money is still available, but I think we could take it one step further and actually have communities who have used their reserves create creatively, um, you know, have a session with these communities so they can think about what their application or what their request would be uh, and try to do it in a creative fashion. I think just letting them know the money is there is a good step and it's the important first step, but backing that up with maybe some uh, brainstorming to get them to think either on behalf of their town or on behalf of the region to think about how to use their reserve uh, effectively um, I think would be a good step and it follows up on your recommendation or your thought of having kind of a best practices session for that. Yeah I think um, even having I mentioned to Joe having a couple of our successful applicants from last year be part of that so they can give their own, you know, thoughts of how they approach the application process. But I think you're right. This is a real opportunity and it's, I, do you feel good about the timing, Commissioner Stebbins, that it would be until the end of calendar year 2021 that that's sufficient amount of time? I, I do. And, um, you know, I thought that was a good recommendation from Joe and his team. And obviously mm -hmm. some of the smaller communities, it's also having the uh, the bandwidth and the team to, you know, again, kind of take an award. They got to put it out for bid if they're looking for certain services, you know, make a contract for those services. So I think, I think the allocation of time uh, certainly works um, uh, for Joe's recommendation. So I, I'm on board with uh, his recommendation. Other comments for Joe on this, on this piece that he's looking for some guidance on? If, if I could um, jump in. Commissioner Cameron, I, yes. Thank you, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I agree with um, and hadn't thought of um, the idea of trying to assist them because there may be impacts uh, that they just haven't considered. And if other, other communities have and they can learn from what other communities have done. So this effort is not just, we want the money back. It really is, we're keeping track, but. We're trying to assist you with uh, making sure you've you've really considered um, all impacts and um, 
as Commissioner Stebbins said, a creative um, approach as some communities have taken. So I really, I really do support this. Uh, two things: support the um, uh, the idea of you know having the money committed till the end of 2000 by the end of uh, 2021, but in addition to that, um, assisting with um, a workshop or whatever we're going to call it to assist those communities in understanding. Uh, what other communities have done and they may it may it may be that their communities have the same uh, impacts they hadn't really thought it through the way some have so two good ideas yeah i think you know the notion on this whole thing is really that we we would love the people to use the money but there's a point where we we can't let it sit out there forever as well commissioner zunica did you want to comment yeah um Thank you. Actually, and it's on that very thought that uh, that Joe just expressed that um, I think I'd like to at least just comment on uh, a prior um, part of the guidelines, Joe, where where we roll over up to for for up to three years monies that are unused. I still mm -hmm. I don't know that we'll solve it today, but I still um, have not quite pictured in my mind how monies ultimately get reverted back to the fund prior to let's say that can then be allocated among the different regions if we always um, roll forward everything from up to three years to the following year um, and, and continue to do that um, i think there's a, there's a formula there somewhere where we have to say um, once you have not expended a multiple, let's say, of the funds on any given year, we might need to revert that portion back. But it's something that I think needs to be sort of modeled. This is only the first time that we're doing this, uh, as, as you point out. Um, and and, and that's, that's great that Region B has uh, a lot more available. Um, the point is that as, as we do this uh, from year to year, I think there's, a, there's something for us to think about as to what exactly is going to be the mechanism to revert back those monies that are unused. Because that, those could grow substantially, this, this is my point. Yeah, and I think, so we are right now in year three, this will be our third year of this, so I, I think we want to at least play this thing out through the way it was designed to see what happens at the end of year three. Do, does any money actually revert back or do we, um, you know, like I think the for instance here is that the, um, you know, the money, chances are that this 2018 money will all be used this year and some of the two, and we'll, probably break into some of the 2019 money or maybe all of it and then we'd just be rolling over the money from 2020 and and we're, we're still in good shape so you know we'll have to see how it plays out yeah but but that, it's that figure the third figure that's growing you see uh, how you know it, it also is a function of how much comes in right um if if you never if you if, if you're always generating more than what is being distributed in any given year the, the the balance continues to grow right and that's that's part of my point that there is the, the formula is partially fine as in the rolling over and and we're, we're but eventually there's a balance question in my mind that we also need to consider that if the balance of the fund grows to a certain amount whatever it is three times four times the what we usually see in requests, for example, it's time for us to start thinking about whether even the rollover is is leaving a lot of money on the table. Yep. But again, uh, for for later discussion. Okay. So the um, if there's no other uh, questions about um, or no other uh, comments on that, we'll move on to the specific impact grants. Um, and under this item, under the public safety operational costs, um, you know, we, we do allow public safety uh, 
agencies to come in and they've asked us in the past for money for uh, equipment and they've asked for some uh, overtime uh, monies and so on. Um, I think in here, what I think what, one of the things that we wanted to try to encourage a little bit is uh, potentially doing some training for uh, public safety organizations that's associated with the casino. And um, at this point, I've just put in these few words, including relevant training to try to raise that up a little bit. Um, I've asked Kate Hardigan to take a look into it and see sort of what kinds of training might be available that might be associated with the casino. And she's doing that right now. Um, and Chair, I don't know if you wanted to add in anything on this particular item. Well, I'm gonna, of course, defer to our um, Commissioner Cameron, given her extensive experience um, as a law enforcement officer and, and Commissioner O'Brien, given her experience. But um, I think given our discussion at the last round, it just made me wonder if we wanna prompt um, applicants to think about if they're getting particular equipment, would they also like relevant training? You know, perhaps, you know, if it's, I don't even know if this is the correct language, Commissioner Cameron, I can't see you right now, but, you know, de-escalation or, or the, the kind of training that, that would enhance um, any uh, public safety issues that might arise at a casino. I can't see. Uh, Commissioner Cameron. Oh, you're, you know what, yeah. you're mute. Okay. Can, you hear, can you hear me now? Yes, thank um, you. I would think they would um, certainly um, find that relevant um, and inappropriate to, to have monies to, to conduct those trainings. I know um, that's always an issue for police departments is, um, you know, finding the money for, for things like training. So I, I, I think that's totally appropriate and uh, would be welcome. Do you think there's any other details needed? Uh, I know that Kate's gonna look at it, but I think perhaps there was a question, should we give examples or just relevant training? Associated training is, is sufficient to prompt it? Um, I think if you try to uh, delineate in writing what that training may be, that, that I, I actually think it's fine the way it is. And um, during conversations that, that may be appropriate um, to talk about the different kinds of trainings and similar to what we just spoke about um, the creativity of some communities this may be an appropriate one as well to say just just an fyi this is what another police department is doing with uh, it, what kind of training they're conducting and just so um but they're pretty good i think at talking to one another and understanding um you know what what's what's available so um just highlighting it in this way including relevant training i think is is appropriate right and even if, even if they weren't getting equipment that asking for any equipment that year just asking for funding for training would be fine is what i would hope you know if, if everybody agrees I, I would agree with that wholeheartedly and i think the other the other notion here is i think what we wanted to do was in our outreach sessions you know we're going to be asking you know all of the people who have come in for grants to you know to to attend these and i think you know we're going to talk about sort of things in different modules and i think when we talk about public safety uh grants in there we could you know mention some specifics about what types of training might might be relevant to a casino um, and things of that nature where it's not really here in the guidelines, but when we have these sessions that we could sort of highlight some of those. Any further questions for, for Joe on that? And also, Joe, you just probably want to address public safety operational costs. I guess that's the only highlighted section there, but the yep. amount is still 200,000 and that was, that's been in place since operational costs were introduced. Yes, yep. Okay, um, so the next item here, um, the Hamden County Sheriff's Department, just uh, as you probably recall, uh, in 2016, we awarded uh, Hamden County Sheriff's Office money for, um, to help them uh, on the Western Mass Correctional Alcohol Center in, in providing lease assistance. Um, you know, they were in the footprint of where MGM is now, and they needed to move, and in the 
facility that they were going into, there were significant upgrades that needed to be made to that property um, to handle this, this operation. And so, um, you know, they had obviously increased rent costs associated with that. And we agreed in 2016 that we would uh, give them a maximum of $200,000 over five years or $400,000 per year. Um, this is, uh, 2020 was the last year of that. Um, and when we met with the Hamden County Sheriff's Department as part of our 2020 applications, they did ask for the commission to consider uh, providing this lease assistance going forward. Um, you know, we talked with our local community mitigation advisory committees and the uh, subcommittee on community mitigation. And um, I guess sort of the consensus was that, well, the sheriff's department is eligible to uh, ask for funds. There was, there was a, uh, a casino related impact on them. And as such, and you know, they're a public agency, so a, pub, a public safety agency, so they are eligible to um, uh, come in for an application. The notion of sort of earmarking money over the long term was not looked upon really favorably by the groups, but saying, hey, sure, they can come in for assistance. And so what we're recommending here is, you know, the only reason we spelled this out in the guidelines previously was because essentially we had earmarked money for them that said, really, you need to apply, and as long as there's available money, you get it. Um, and uh, what this would do by eliminating this section, um, it would it would simply need to um, uh, they would need to apply like any other applicant, and it's a competitive fund, and they would be competing against others uh, for for the available funds. Um, so, with that said, um, I think if the commission agrees that we should eliminate this section of the guidelines that um, you know, we should probably send a letter to the, to the sheriff and, and let them know that you know, we're not saying that they can't apply for money. They certainly can apply for money, but they, are, they would simply be an applicant like any other um, in sort of competing for these funds. So I guess, again, at this point, I'd like to pause and, and, and just get the commission's input on this on whether or not they're in favor of just sort of eliminating this or if, if there's another approach that you think we should take. I'm in favor of eliminating these and uh, and again treating them like everyone else, much like the people from the local community mitigation point um, committees are are suggesting. But this doesn't preclude them from uh, reapplying, um, and um, it needs to be taken into context with available monies and other requests at the time, like that would imply if they simply apply with everyone else. Yeah, I would agree with that. The only factor that I might consider extending this language any further is if their initial lease when they were displaced uh, theoretically would still be ongoing. I think I've mentioned this before in the briefings um, to go back and really that. Um, but other than that, if that's not the case, then yeah, I do think it's time to eliminate it and treat them like any other applicant. I would agree with that, and, and because we did um, lay out specifically what the time frame was initially, so this is actually, this will be a new request, and um, outside of that time frame that was originally um, designated, so I, I agree that they should now apply with a separate application and uh, make the point, make the case for why the assistance is uh, continues to be, uh, they continue to be in need of that assistance. Commissioner Stebbins? Yeah, only uh, to add that when we discussed this with the, you know, the Region B uh, LICMAC, uh, there was uh, also consensus that uh, it was time to take a new approach and, and, and that the Sheriff's Office could certainly come back and apply like any other app. Okay. Um, 
So the next item, just uh, under 2.3, uh, just a name change. We used to have transportation planning grants and then non-transportation planning grants. Um, I always thought that was a little too bureaucratic. So I thought using the name community planning grants maybe was a little more uh, uh, explanatory of what those, uh, those grants are. Um, so the next item here um, on transportation construction grants, there's a couple of items in here. One is the first one is whether or not we want to put a, a cap on the amount of assistance that the commission would give to a project. And also if we wanted to modify the uh, dollar values of, uh, of the grants. Am I coming through okay? I just got my message that my internet connection is unstable. It was just a brief disruption. I think we captured everything. Okay. Um, so in essence, what, what happened in 2020, it was our first year of these transportation construction grants, and we didn't put a cap on the amount of money that the commission would spend on a project. Um, and what we wound up with was we had applications where um, in, in sort of the the one circumstance, you know, the, the commission was only paying about 10% of the total project cost. And in other instances, we had applicants request 100% of the funds be paid for by the commission. And I think, you know, all of these things, the notion was, while we didn't put a cap on it, the notion was that really, we, we didn't want to be the, the, the tail wagging the dog here, that, that really there was, um, usually on most of these projects, there was a significant benefit to the community in general, while also mitigating a casino impact. And the amount of money that we put towards those projects should sort of be commensurate with mitigating the impact. You know, just as an example, um, last year on, on our Chelsea project, um, they're doing a major road reconstruction, um, but it also includes water, sewer, drainage improvements, um, pedestrian improvements, bike improvements, a whole lot of other things that are certainly great for the community, but are not really, but no, are not necessarily addressing an impact of the casino. Now, the thing that is addressing the impact of the casino is the increased amount of traffic that's using. So in, in this case, in that case, we ended up providing, I think it was, oh, about 18% or something of the total project costs, which seemed to us to be a reasonable amount of money. So what I've done here is um, I, I put in a number of that we would pay a maximum of 25% of the total project cost. And again, that significant other federal, state, local, private, or other funding needs to be available for the remaining cost. And we also put in this you know, waiver requirement saying that if the applicant really can really demonstrate that the cost associated with mitigating the impact exceeds that limit, we would certainly consider it. Um, and then the other piece is um, last year we had three million as a cap for the total amount of grants with one million for any individual uh, grant. Now these roadway projects are very expensive or can be very, very expensive. So um, the thought here was that, you know, we. We had over six million dollars in applications last year, and we actually went over our target amount by a little bit. We awarded 3.2 million. So the, the thought here, and I think the folks at MAPC were um, in favor of increasing the limits to maybe maybe making it four million statewide and maybe uh, one and a half million on on the grant. I think. I would be in favor of sort of raising the overall cap, but maybe not raising the individual project cap, because that essentially, you know, so we're saying if we gave someone a million dollars and we went with this 25% cap, that would pay, you know, for up to a $4 million project, which is a pretty good size, you know, roadway project. Um, so the, I guess those are the two questions that I have for the commission. Um, are you comfortable? with sort of this 25% number, um, you know, last year where we didn't have a cap, we did give, I think, um, you know, West Springfield, we gave about 31% towards the project. And I think in, uh, in Malden, we gave uh, about a third of the project costs. So, I mean, this, 
not hard and fast rule. We could maybe go a third. Um, I don't think I'd feel comfortable going anything over that. Um, so, and, and the other thing is when we, when we talked to our advisory committees, they were all over the board with this. I think most of them felt there should be some kind of a cap, but nobody could really put their finger on what they thought it should be. I think the only thing that got thrown out was a dollar for dollar match, which would mean a maximum of 50% paid by the commission. Um, so again, I guess I'd, I'd like a little input on that, on whether we think 25% is good, do we think a third is good? Um, do we wanna have a cap at all? Um, we could go back to the language that we had last year, um, where we say that we'll only provide a percentage of the project cost and that we need these significant other sources of funds. So I guess I'd like to pause there and, and get a little bit of input from the commission on this particular item. Commissioner Stebbins, do you wanna chime in first? I see you sure. in the lineup first. Sure, thanks Madam Chair. Um, you know, I think Joe has laid this out pretty well and, and, and as he pointed out, we had a, a, a lot of opinions coming back at us uh, uh, from the subcommittees and the local committees. Uh, but I think, with, you know, this is only going into our second year of doing these transportation construction grants. So I think we still have some uh, experience and some track record to build upon here. But, uh, you know, Joe mentioned the, the projects that we did award um, and, you know, the Chelsea one, the West Springfield one, uh, which were really strong applications, uh, certainly did not attribute the need for the grant completely to uh, mitigating traffic to the casino. Uh, certainly demonstrated that the project was sound, they had other sources of funding. So, you know, looking at our first year of grants, those were great models and I'd like to see us kind of build off of that. So I think the recommendation here is, is sound. We still have the opportunity to waive, uh, waive the requirement um, and, you know, as we go into our second year of this, we'll see what we get in terms of applications. But uh, I think building off the model of what I consider uh, a couple of good applications that we got this year and they were funded that uh, this follows that model and, and we'll see what we get this year. But I think it's, I think it's a sound recommendation. Commissioners? Uh could I could I comment, please? Um, yeah, sure. Thank I, you. I can't um, quite see you on my. I have to scroll okay. down there now. I can see you. Okay, um, Joe. I I wondered where last year we did set some precedent in, in awarding thirty one percent and thirty three percent. If it wouldn't make more sense to stick with that and and consider a third of the cost here, I think the more direction we can give communities uh, really assist them with their planning and what they're able to come up with as as a match so i just wondered since we did um, start last year with a 31 percent and a 33 um, percent match if that would make some sense here as well um, yeah certainly you know i mean i i don't think there's there's not really a magic number i don't think but i you know the, the, but the reality is is that most of these projects that we're going to see will have a very large benefit to the community. You know, the, the recommendation from one of our our members of a, you know, a dollar for dollar match, you know, 50% seemed to be very high to me, but I could certainly live with, with a one third. I, I, it feels to me, um, if I may, uh, that the third is, 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 is fine and appropriate if, if not only for the president, as um, Commissioner Cameron says, but uh, the fact that you know, generally, I think of three ma major players in, in in some of these grants: state, local, and ourselves. And that sort of leaves, you know, a third each, at least from a sort of rough stand starting standpoint. Um, I think, uh, oh, by the way, that um, the the waiving. Um, language is, is, is key and I think is central. So it really matters not too much in terms of, you know, going from 25 to 33 percent. But, um, but, but ultimately I agree with, again, Commissioner Cameron, that it's good to have some planning figures for communities and, and a third would be, would be inappropriate. 
I, I am intending to agree as well, although um, I'm absolutely willing to defer to Joe. I guess I'm more influenced, uh, though, Joe, when I hear that there, uh, the extent to which the local community advisory committees, the community, community mitigation advisory committees might have been pushing back. Were they, did they indicate um, that it can be a real challenge to get the partners and they were fear, fearful about that? Was there any indication why they were even looking for the direct match? Anything you'd want to add? Yeah, there were, there were some some of the folks who were saying, well, you know, maybe a community just simply doesn't have any matching funds that they can use. And this is the only source of funds for that type of project. Yeah. Um, you know, that's, that, you know, that may or may not be true. I mean, if we're talking transportation construction, you know, every, every community gets some state money, they get chapter 90 money and, and so on. Um, but yes, th there certainly could be instances where there's the local community can't put up any money towards the project and they can ask for a waiver from that. And, you know, obviously I think we would probably consider something more if it was on a much smaller end of the scale than on a much larger end of the scale. Um, you know, if someone came in with a $5 million project and said, well, I can't afford any local match. I want you to pay for the whole thing. Um, and it would blow our entire budget. There's probably not high likelihood that we would grant that waiver. <laughs> and this is, I think, an opportunity to build the capacity again in the workshop or whatever scenario we're imagining it to be so that they, um, you know, they see or hear from Chelsea that was so successful last year with one of these grants, you know, oh, who were your partners? How did you access you know the the you know maybe the funds are, aren't so obvious. So I think I'm inclined to say let's go let's stay with the 33 percent and then see where it trends for next year. You know, um, okay. if it turns out we get a lot of interest, um, and we need to reduce, right, Commissioner Cameron, um, Commissioner O'Brien, we haven't heard from you, and I know um, Commissioner Stebbins, you might want to chime back in because you were suggesting for the 25. So. I'm, I'm comfortable with either 25 or a third. I mean, I think if we have historical precedent for going up to a third, that might be a nice place to start. Uh, but again, if Joe's experience is and judgment is that 25 is more appropriate, I, I'd be comfortable with either percentage. Yeah. Commissioner Stebbins, you want to help us out? You're, you're the, um, the real expert on all of these. Um, I don't know about that, but, um, you know, I, 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 I um, I do take heed of my uh, my colleague's point about you know what we awarded last year. I think Commissioner Zuniga and Commissioner Cameron made a good point that uh, you know the one the good solid projects that we did award were right around that thirty percent or thirty three percent. So I'm comfortable with moving moving the number up there. Again, you know, ultimately this all comes back to um, the commission's discretion and you know the review. Um, and input of our of our new community team. So um, I think it's a good benchmark. And again, we're we're only we only have one year under our belt, so we'll um, we'll uh, pay attention to the requests that we get in this year. Looks like Joe's making a decision. Well, I, I'm hearing a consensus. So I've I've uh, and and Enrique, I'm using SharePoint here. So making changes in real time. Uh -huh, I saw it. That's how I like it. <laughs> um, and then I guess the other question is, again, do you, um, do you feel comfortable uh, sort of raising this amount? I was thinking of going sort of from 3 million to 4 million and would keep the cap at a million. Again, they can always ask for a waiver if it's really uh, a project that seems to, to, to make sense to do, you know, more than a million. Uh, Joe, can you remind us what the total was last year for those two projects that were 31 and 33 percent? What was that? Uh, what was that number? So West Springfield, they, we gave them a million dollars, and that was uh, about 31 percent. Although I've seen recent cost estimates where it looks like that number might wind up being a little bit less than that. I think their final cost estimates are coming in a little bit higher. Um, and the other one was the um, the bike path over in um, by Wellington Station. That was the one we gave them 
about a third of the, the, the cost. So, Which was how much, do you know, do you remember? Uh, and actually, in that case, they ended up asking for quite a bit more than than a third of the cost, and we ended up sort of cutting it down. It was about five hundred and uh, I'm going to say it was five hundred and sixty thousand, if memory serves, somewhere around there. So, so the one million is is really in line with with what we've done. Meaning, it, it it's not. It doesn't seem like, even though we're thinking of a third, that it's necessary to move that higher than a million. Right. Well, we did give Chelsea one and a half million, you know, in the in the two categories, but theirs was on a twelve million dollar project, mm -hmm. so their percentage was quite low. Okay. I think that so was again, your question, Com Commissioner Cameron. Right. So the Chelsea one was much bigger than the other two. Right. Yes. It still seems okay. appropriate to me to keep it at a million, and then, you know, there's always the way to um, to make the case for more if necessary right yeah yeah so so joe though you said you might want to increase that to four yeah you know we got over six million in applications last year um you know and and we did cut a couple of them down uh that, that uh malden one we reduced the amount in the city of boston one we reduced the amount a little bit um you know, we still did award more than three million. So my thought is, if we if we raised it to four, that gives us a little bit more flexibility. Obviously, we don't have to hit those targets. You know, if the applications aren't good. Um, I'm I'm not usually the big spender, but I'm okay with send, raising it to four as 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 a as a target, just given the balances that are now greater than last year, and that. Um, even though there was a suspension of operations of casino, um, you have already taken that into account for planning purposes. Can I just ask one more follow-up question? When I think about the Chelsea as a $12 million project, I'm really building on Commissioner Cameron's good point. Um, that was 12 million and the other two really were in the more of the vicinity of three to four or, if I, or two to three. Um, are are we limiting ourselves by having that one million dollars? Because obviously Chelsea ended up with one five, so they would have had to ask for a waiver this year. Or do we want to think about the scale typically being in the three to four million dollar or two to three million dollar project rather than the twelve million dollar projects? Right, because essentially by keeping that million dollar limit, we're essentially if if they get the maximum if they're asking for the maximum percentage of a third that would that would limit the project to basically a three million dollar project right and so that, i guess that's just my question um do, is that the scale that we want to be at or do we want to be at a bigger scale like the chelsea project and if so do we increase that that one million i i don't have an opinion i'm just raising the question you know, my thought, I guess, really is for this year, let's keep it at the million and see what we get. You know, we are only in year two of this. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, you know, that Chelsea project wound up, you know, being bigger than I expected it to be, you know, that coming in for this money. Because um, I, I think the thought was really that we would be looking at you know, if we're providing a million, that you know, it'll be a three to four million dollar project as as sort of the maximum that we would fund. Um, you know, provide a portion of that funding. Um, so this does two things, though. The the million dollars also provides another limitation on. So we say we'll fund a maximum of a third of the project cost, but if they have a project that's five million dollars and they ask for a million, we're only funding twenty percent of that. And again, I think we're trying to weigh what the impact of the casino is and how much of the project we're paying for. You know, how much of it's really due to the impact of the casino and how much of it is a benefit for the local community. And the bigger the project is, frankly, I think the more benefit there is to the local community than maybe you know, addressing, again, with Chelsea, they did, you know, they were doing water and sewer and drainage improvements. 
which is absolutely appropriate to do. Hey, while you're tearing up the road, you might as well, you know, you might as well fix everything while you're there, but that doesn't mean we should be paying for it. Any, any questions uh, for Joe on this? I think then you would put change that three to a four. That was what you were anticipating. Yeah, I think that's, you know. And keep the one. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Commissioners, okay. I'll set on that. Okay. Thank you. And so uh, the next item is on the workforce development grants. Um, we're really not proposing any real changes to the program, but we did add in this sort of introductory paragraph just to hopefully give a little bit more context to uh, to the to the groups who may come in looking for funds. Um, you know, we we talk about what happened in 2020, how we had to eliminate um, the hospitality and culinary programs, basically because you know, because of the shutdowns, the COVID shutdowns, and applications. But also trying to keep in mind that you know, these programs have to have a direct correlation to the impact from the casino. Now, again, we're not eliminating. We're not saying that they can't come in for hospitality or culinary programs, but they really need to demonstrate that there's a need there. And it was quite interesting in one of our advisory committee meetings, and I can't remember who the person was that, that said this, but was talking about how a lot of folks who are in you know, the culinary uh, business or hospitality, if there's a large, large layoffs like there were, a lot of these folks will just leave the business altogether and go do something else. Um, so it doesn't necessarily mean the second that a restaurant reopens, there's this whole long line of people just waiting to come back to work. Um, there may be, or there may not be, but I think the, the whole point is that we're not trying to limit, we're not, we're not saying for 2021 that we're not going to pay for those things. We need them to make that good, compelling case that, um, that there's a real demand for these kind of uh, photos and see what are, what are their what are their needs? What kinds of you know that you know they are hiring now? You know the, the casinos are hiring. They're bringing people back, but you know um, so we need to understand you know from these groups uh, what the real needs are. So that's all that that paragraph really does is just try to put things in, in a little bit of context um. without making any. Mr. Stevens? Uh, yeah, it, let me just jump in. I, you know, I, 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 think, I think the language that you're including um, kind of reflects where we are, uh, but it, uh, it also um, endorses what we have always said when it comes to workforce development grants is that we want the applicants, and they've been mostly led by community colleges um, and the workforce boards, we want them to uh, make an application that reflects the need of the local licensee. So they need to demonstrate that they've had that communication uh, with our licensees to look at what the real needs are. Um, Director Griffin and I had a call with one licensee and surprisingly the issue of culinary training came up and uh, actual shortage of, of applicants for some of their culinary jobs. So um, I think the language as you have it really spells out that uh, each application from region A or region B is going to be different, but it needs to be focused on you know the applicant having direct conversations with uh, with our licensees to make sure that that their uh, application is sound. Any further comments on this section? Thanks, all set, Joe. Excellent. Okay, and then- um, Thanks to Jill too on that. Oh yes, yeah, Jill and Crystal, um, you know, have done a lot of work on on, on pulling th those sections together for us. Yeah, Crystal too, yes, thank you. Um, so the next section is the emergency mitigation grants, which you've already talked about a little bit in the discussion on the regulations. Um, so what we're suggesting here is that we're we're looking at two hundred thousand dollars, which seems to be an amount that's it's substantial enough to probably be able to address a a need, but it's not so large as to 
hamstring the program um, by you know sort of setting aside a, a large chunk of money. Um, so what we're and what we're saying here is that that any impact must be newly identified and be of an emergency nature that would cause significant harm to the community if it were not remedied in an expeditious fashion. So, you know, this, this is not intended to circumvent our normal processes. You know, any, any uh, person that came in with this, you know, they would have to follow all of our specific impact grant requirements and so on. Um, that it's, um, again, it's just, it's not a way to circumvent the normal processes. What we're saying here really in this last line is that you need to contact us if you if you're if you're gonna think about using this and we need to have a really good discussion on you know what category does this grant fall under what you know what do we need for application materials um, is this truly an emergency is this something that could wait for the next grant round or is this something that really needs to be done today um, so we didn't try to get Oh, you froze. Release might evolve. You you froze just for a bit, so okay, you didn't sorry. you uh, didn't intend to get too. We didn't want to get too specific in in the guidelines. You know, we wanted to give us some flexibility flexibility because we just don't know what that emergency might constitute. You know, uh, you know, it's it's so unknown that we don't want to. Uh, try to write this long set of regulations on something that can't, well, not regulations, but guidelines on something that we have no idea what it's going to be. So, um, and obviously anything, anybody who came in for an emergency grant, um, you know, we would have to come back to the commission, you know, at, at, at that point to say, hey, this is the emergency and here's, you know, we'd have to keep the commission up to date and the commission would need to vote on that. Um, you know that emergency application so it's not like it's a uh, just uh you know giving us carte blanche to to start awarding these things um so i guess again i'll just pause there um uh, all of our local community mitigation advisory committees and the uh, the uh, subcommittee on community mitigation everybody really thought this was just a great idea um you know, and the whole notion here is that we hope it never gets used. <laughs> you know, the, the fewer emergencies that we have, the better. Um, but setting aside some money, everybody thought was a great idea. That's great. Uh, great initiative and innovation. Questions for Joe on the emergency mitigation uh, grants. Of course, it correlates with the regulation that we just reviewed. Well, just a, just a, a comment. I think the the language is fine, uh, the way it reads, and I'm glad that um, uh, it's well received and uh, by by the local community mitigation uh, committee committees. Um, the one thing that I can imagine, and I'm not sure how I feel about, it, is perhaps an emergency situation uh, at a at a local level, in which because of budget shortfalls. <laughs> They may be facing uh, the prospect of some layoffs, let's say, of their own staff, uh, and then uh, the, you know uh, they could come to the commission to request you know um, some of that um, uh, relief, if you will. Um, and that's something that I'm not sure is part of the intention of this section. Um, even if, let's say, somebody facing a layoff, uh, at least partially, had been in the past involved in community mitigation related um, um, activities. So uh, it's, I think that's just to say that uh, uh, the language is not explicit about that. That's fine. Uh, that's what I imagine might be um, what we might see. Uh, in you know, in, especially in the near, um, in the next year or two, uh, given the situation around us, um, and we'll just have to analyze it the same way we do every other project with the uh, the, the um, nexus to the casino, the impact to the community, and 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 whatnot. Uh, but I figure I just mentioned that because that's what I imagine might be. Um, one situation we might see. 
commissioners, do you want to chime in? Um, I, I think this will be application specific and it's so hard to, for me anyway, to really think about what it could be, but seeing it and, and reading the case for the emergency um, and the need uh, that would cause harm, I think are critical elements. So I, I, until you see it, it's hard for me to think about what it could be. But I do think this idea is excellent for sure to have it there in case. Yeah, and I'm, um, Commissioner Zuniga, I'm not sure if I follow on the layoff piece, what you were alluding to. Um, well, if I, if I may, I could, I could further explain. We could, again, I'm not saying this is, this is what, uh, what would happen, but we may be un inadvertently creating the, the, an incentive to, um, if somebody was facing uh, the need for layoffs because there's a budget shortfall, for them to come in and say, let's apply to the to this emergency grant to make sure we don't do a layoff um, because we have a budget shortfall. Um, they and somebody might again. This is a bit of a of a moral hazard, but somebody might be saying, you know, if you don't, uh, you know, if, if if unless I get money from from other sources, we're going to have to let go of uh, some people, and they have uh, in the past done some work that is community communication related and that's my emergency uh, and again in that situation um, you know from their perspective is perfectly legitimate uh, we would then analyze it like we do every other grant and say well what's the nexus to the casino and we want to make sure that you're not just putting this emergency on this spawn but that's what i imagine as a scenario uh, that could happen and one situation that occurs to me was not necessarily the intention of um, something like this that it would be for really an emergency that's related to the casino but again uh, I think uh, I, I think that that's absolutely right I do think uh, and, I, and I don't know if Derek is still on but just in case anyone were to hear this I'm not sure if 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 those if these funds could be used that way but that's a, maybe a topic for another another day um i don't know if derek is still on but in terms of these kinds of funds being able to be used for um individual jobs like that um well i i, I can imagine that's a good question but i can imagine if in the past we have paid for 50 percent of a planner for example like i know we have for uh, the, the, the city planner to do some planning around X, Y, or Z, that mm -hmm. that person is, let's say, no longer being funded by the community mitigation fund because they've gone on to plan other things. And that uh, that person might be facing, hopefully not, I but see. facing, facing a, a layoff and then a community say, well, let's go, let's go and, and um, I see. into this mm -hmm. fund to make sure we don't lose them, which, Again, I want to emphasize, it's a legitimate a thing to probably want to do if you're the community. My point is, that's a scenario that it, that may not necessarily have been envisioned when when we, as we were drafting this, as, right. a, as a budget sort of plug, if you will, in truly emergency situations for some communities. I, I think it, I think Commissioner Zuniga raises a good point. Um, but I would hearken back to the language that Joe has included here, which is unanticipated casino related impacts. I think as communities think about budgeting, they look at what the, the COVID closures might have done to uh, a source of revenue for their community that, you know, they're in, you know, there is, there is some expectation and planning around uh, the impacts that those might have on a local municipal budget. So, um, uh, you know, as Joe point, you know, Joe used a great example when we were talking to the local communities about this. It's certainly an example we don't hope happens, um, but you know, it really is intended to be something that is completely unforeseen um, and you know pops up on you know on an emergency basis. And I think as Commissioner Cameron Cameron reflected, we're going to look at what's in the application and view it almost on a case-by-case -case basis, but our hope is that 
this money may never get tapped uh, if we keep to a strict definition and again something that is completely unanticipated by the community and it comes before us mm -hmm. yeah any further questions or comments on on this language for joe all set i think it's okay i just have one more one more item which is um rescission of grants um you know the, the the situation is we do have several grants out there that um where money has not been spent on them um and what this does is this gives us the ability to rescind those grants if we uh find it necessary now we're not again similar to the um reserves we're not suggesting that we just want to unilaterally pull this money back um, we're saying here that before any grant is rescinded, the commission staff will notify the grantee that the expenditures on the grant are not timely and establish a timeline for the grantee to either expend the funds or have the grant rescinded. So, you know, we'd give them certainly uh, a, a final bite at the apple to say to us, oh, yeah, we really do want to move ahead with this. Um, you know, look, and if there are legitimate delays for some reason, um, uh, you know, we can certainly consider that and all. But, um, you know, in our contract language, our contracts are a four year term and they are also, they, those can be extended. Um, you know, so we just wanted to get something in the guidelines that just explained to people that if you don't spend this money, we can take it back. I think this is gonna be more and more uh, relevant as as time progresses, uh, um, and the, the reserves um, may not be quite a good example because they're meant as a reserve. But um, I, I agree with this in, the inclusion of this language, and uh, and I agree that it needs to be a bit of a judgment call based on the particulars of the project or the the community's efforts with any one of those projects, and and, and establishing a. a uh, a hard and fast timeline on the guideline, I don't think would be appropriate. I would, I would agree. I think, um, I think Joe has got a good plan in place to reach out to the communities that have been slow to draw down on some of the grants that we've awarded in the past. Um, and Joe, I think if, if I'm not mistaken, there might even be a second category where the commission approved a grant request, but a contract was never executed. Um, and, you know, those might be in, you know, those, I'm thinking of one in particular as it relates to Encore Boston Harbor, that the project itself just may simply not be moving forward right now or in the foreseeable future. And the question becomes, should we consider pulling back some of those grant awards that were never executed in the contract. Yeah, that's, I mean, in, in that particular case, um, you know, where the contracts were never executed, we, we held those back specifically saying, well, we have to get some assurances that other things are gonna happen first. And, you know, we haven't been able to get those assurances. So, um, you know, technically we could probably just, I mean, that, that grant technically has never really been awarded. So uh, we could just make it kind of disappear, I suppose, if we wanted to do that. Um, but I think we just want to be sort of above board on all of these things saying, you know, we'd obviously have to let the communities know that, you know, we're not moving, you know, this thing's not moving ahead. So we can't, we can't give you the money, you know, and there's, there's always this notion of maybe we can repurpose it to something else or whatever. And, um, you know, we can certainly talk with folks about, things, but I mean, it has to be really closely related to what they were proposed. I mean, this is a competitive program, so we're rating a project on what it's supposed to do, and we can't say we're just going to take money for, you know, a roadway design and then give it to, uh, you know, building a bike path or something. I, you know, I, it's just, it's probably not appropriate to do that. Um, so yeah, we just want to, um, you know, get this out there that we have this ability to do that and that we uh, we'll do it if necessary. And I, and I think your plan and approach to, you know, having 
a good conversation with with the communities that receive the award. I think is straightforward and you know appropriate, and you know we want to be completely transparent with uh, how we go about taking some of the steps as it relates to any possible rescission. Okay, so that is all that I had. So I guess our next uh, step on this, unless there are other, those couple of changes that we made as we went along, and we're gonna send this out for uh, public input. So what I will do is between today and tomorrow, I'll just clean up the document a little bit and, and uh, uh, we will put it out for public comment. We put it out for a couple of weeks. And then we uh, intend to come back in front of the commission, I believe on November 19th for a final approval of the guidelines. So we'll get our public input and then we'll incorporate anything if we need to and we'll have that final meeting uh, where we can go over any of the changes that we may or may not have made uh, based on public input. and. Um, and if we can get this out by the 19th, that's great. That puts us a couple weeks ahead of where we uh, where we have typically been on this in the last couple of years. So it'll give our um, applicants a couple more weeks to, to prepare their applications. That sounds good. I think it is November 19th. I can, um, we can confirm that. Shara's shaking her head, so I'm, that sounds good. And any further questions for Joe before he cleans? cleans up the document. Doesn't look like you have much left to do. You're doing it in real time, Joe. Oh, he might have froze again. Well, he froze, I'll just, but he I'll froze just say he nicely. Did. He did. He, um, but what a shot. He froze not nicely. Always, not always the case. Just to say that uh, great work, great work yeah, on, yeah, we're uh, pretty on good. There is great work of consultation uh, with the local community, uh, local committees, um, a lot of thought into the policy questions and the draft. So thank you. All right, thanks. Um, and I just wanna acknowledge uh, Commissioner Stebbins because I, I know that he not only has been so, so such an important support for this team, but also he chairs the Region B um, Look, Mac, and so um, thank you for your leadership on that. That input, you know, it's becoming clear and clear to me how important that local input is, and really serves as the foundation for Joe's team's work. So thank you. Well, the the new community team, Joe and Mary and Tanya, have been great to work with and uh, doing uh, doing some great work. Thanks. So that looks like we can move on then to item number seven, thank Commissioner. You. Oh, thank you, Joe. Commissioner Zimica, you have a, a, a matter today you want to bring forward. Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I, um, I wanted to bring up uh, a bit of an update on the draft of the annual report um, and give a little history and then the, the peculiarity of, to, of this year um, and get feedback before we, we drafted something that needed to be um, corrected or we edited. Um, just as a reminder, the, the, the annual report uh, covers the fiscal year, which ends in Ju on June 30th. And we end up, uh, we close the year, the financials uh, around uh, August and September, we end up drafting a lot of that in the months that we are now, September and October, and in the past have issued the report around uh, late November or even December. Um, uh, and we are in good, we are making a lot of great progress um, as we speak, and we will be bringing back a draft uh, very soon. This year, and um, in, in, the, in that history or in that, with that background, there have been instances in the past where we're writing the report in September or what have you, and um, even though the period closes on June 30th, um, I say because we're going to be eventually distributing the report um, in, in November or December, it's, it's, um, it's relevant or uh, pertinent to put in the report information that may have been 
uh, after the, the, the June 30th deadline, but relevant and perhaps even uh, discussed publicly or in the news. In a, as a particular example, in this year, we had undertaken the process of relicensing PEN. We speak a lot about it. We had spoken about it before uh, in the prior report. And even though the, the report covers until June 30th, the actual relicensing did happen sometime in September. And it's important not to be silent as we are drafting the report on that particular topic. And we do mention it. One particular, and so that has been, uh, continues to be the, the the modus operandi, um, but in, in one particular section uh, this year, I wanted to bring to your attention, um, and that is we usually put in a casino summary, the, a, a page of each of the properties with the actual specifics, the gaming positions, the square footage, the, the, um, the amenities, uh, the, the restaurants and bars, and and what have you. And that's usually a good description uh, for the reader at any given time to see what's, uh, what's part of what we regulate. Uh, needless to say that um, those uh, statistics, if you will, are very different depending on what we take into account. If we take into account pre-March, the pre-pandemic, uh, the gaming positions were, you know, what we all know, are uh, fully um, available. Uh, as of the closure of the year, the fiscal year, the gaming positions were zero. The, they were all effectively closed. And when they, uh, when the, when the operations resumed, those positions were significantly different by virtue of the physical distancing and um, and guidelines and, and, and uh, that we that we imposed. So um, on that particular matter, I wanted to bring that up and discuss it and get, um, get a feeling for what uh, and how we should report. Um, I have an idea or a recommendation that sort of tries to tell the whole story. And that is to essentially put a before and after of what is what was before the, um, the, the suspension of operations and what is after when we um, uh, agreed to reopen the properties um, uh, sometime in July and, um, and have that discussion as a, as, a, as a matter of what's a big important thing to report uh, as part of that report. So I can pause there and take questions um, or, or, or hear comments. Um, Madam Chair, I'll jump in. Um, I think Commissioner Zuniga raises a couple of good points. Um, you know, certainly making some notation that the fact that I'm going to, I think he had two questions. One, how do we deal with the issue of the pen relicensing and mentioning it? Um, I think that's fine to kind of add a section or a footnote to say, you know, with the publication of this report, we had done X, Y, Z, even though the real you know, issue around relicensing came up during the fiscal year itself. Um, and I think with respect to, you know, kind of the COVID related impacts, um, uh, I think we'd be a little tone deaf if we didn't talk about it somehow, um, even though, you know, some of the work uh, carried over into the new fiscal year. But um, I think, you know, providing some information, being completely transparent as to the impact and the fact that we acknowledge the start of this in one fiscal year and carrying over, I think is gonna make a, a more thoughtful report that will have a lot more information for it. Uh, this goes out to legislators, lawmakers, stakeholders. Um, you know, I think it would provide them a good round picture, even though the, the course of the report would somewhat extend it to the new fiscal year. So I'm completely on board on those recommendations. Commissioner O'Brien or uh, Cameron? Yeah, I, uh, I agree as well. Both strong recommendations, important to include in this year's annual report um, in the format, you know, probably similar to something we've done in the past would be appropriate. 
but um, I thank Commissioner Zuniga for taking on this project every year and being thoughtful about what changes uh, would be appropriate. I, I would agree with that. I, I think it's absolutely necessary to make a reference um, to what happened this year and it, the, the structure and, and the approach sound appropriate. I'm imagining you can maybe do, do like some kind of a table and, and categorize even maybe the shutdown period. It might be interesting, even if it's all zeros. We do know it won't be all zeros for PPC because of just the ADW. Um, if that gets included, I'm not sure if that's part of the, re the typical reporting for PPC there. But, uh, you know, you do have some, I think it would be, I, I think, tone deaf, um, uh, as Bruce said, but also it's, it's data. It is, and you wouldn't want to include that snapshot, you know, in a complete fashion. But I think probably the trick is, is that you are going to be seeping into the next fiscal year. But I think with just, you know, I think that's okay, um, you know, with clear guidance. I, it's, good, it's good to hear a, a clear consensus. And that was my feeling, but I, I did want to bring it up uh, and, and have this discussion um, because it's such a, it's such a, anomaly really in, in terms really. of um, of this pandemic and how we how we report and what we report and by the way there are, there is pl plenty of language um, in in the current draft acknowledging uh, what happened uh, that that you know the, right. the dates that we went uh, and voted on on uh, suspension of the operations when we uh, voted to uh, uh, reopen etc cetera, etc cetera. it is that snapshot that uh, really became um, that I did want to mention, uh, uh, if nothing else, as an update. But I'm glad to to, to hear that we all seem to be uh, in consensus here. That is important to report as well. Any other issues so far that you've identified, Commissioner? No, just uh, regular editing. You know, needing to take away the um, the passive voice, which I, uh, as an editor, I, I find myself doing, uh, and. Uh, but, Commis but, uh, you saw Commissioner O'Brien. That's in particular. Yeah. No, I I, I remember. Uh, uh, she 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 like me uh, has uh, embedded this notion that it's it's better to be uh, uh, always writing in the active voice. But um, um, you know, just um, getting everybody to um, I, I I take the credit, but it's everybody else who writes it. I'm just trying to shepherd and edit uh, um, those sections. Um, Every section uh, that we have in the report has a couple of people that, like Joe, for example, and Mary, work hard on, on all these um, all these things um, relative to community mitigation, and they're the ones who write it and uh, and update, uh, and 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 that's true as well for responsible gaming and, and workforce and, and and IEB and technology. So um, it's going well. It's um, we're trying to continue to make the um, make sure that we don't go past December too much, um, so that we we can we can keep to the same cadence. So anyway, that's the update. Thank you. Any other updates, commissioners? I'm seeing no, no. Uh, Karen, I'm going to swing back to you. Anything that anything that's happened during this time that you need to. No, I've Update been monitoring something. my phone and my email, and we're all good. <laughs> that's a good. That's a good sign. So, um, nothing to add in at this moment. Yeah. Okay. Then, not hearing any further business, do I have a motion? Motion to adjourn. Second. Second. Just want to thank the, everybody. Um, excellent work. Uh, you know, all of this is all being done remotely except for of course our racing team and uh, we just thank everybody and of course the gaming agents who are on the gaming floor we think of you all who are out um, outside of your home working on behalf of the commission we just want to thank each of you for you know every day going through and attending to the, the typical routine work that you're so good at during still this really trying environment so thank you Okay, barring no objections to adjourning, Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Commissioner Stebbins. Aye. 
<laughs> Good. Commissioner Stebbins? Aye. And Commissioner Zinnega? Aye. And I vote yes. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Shara. Five zero on that. Thank, Thank you, everyone. everybody. Stay safe. Thanks, everyone. Thank Thanks, you. everybody.